Welcome to episode 187 of the Solid Monster Sounds Off. I am the Solid Monster, and we're not going to waste any time here. I've, I've got not one but two special guests on the special edition of Sound Off here. A little bit later on, I'll be speaking with the reigning Ring of Honor World Television Champion and former six-time TNA X Division Champion, Jay Lethal. You definitely don't want to miss that, but first, we have a man on the phone with a dream of perhaps one day challenging Lethal for that very title. He's an independent wrestler making some noise as he climbs up the ranks. His name is The Prodigy, Nathan Banner, and he joins us now on the Sound Off. Nathan, thanks for coming on. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, why The Prodigy? How did you uh, come up with that as a nickname? Um, actually, it was kind of given to me by uh, a buddy of mine that uh, was on uh, FCW for a little bit. And uh, him and I came up with it together, and... I liked it, so I just stuck with it. Now, uh, you're you're very good friends with Jay Lethal, who uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier on, and I, I believe the two of you grew up together. Is that correct? Yeah, we uh, we met each other when we were about uh, 13 in about sixth grade, and uh, we've been close ever since. And uh, he actually helped train you to become a wrestler. How, how did that all come about? Um, yeah, uh, him and I actually started a while ago. Uh, Back when he was training at Jersey All-Pro, he uh, mentioned that he was starting training at Jersey All-Pro, and it's something we always talked about. I happened to be out of the country when uh, he did. uh, They had some tough enough gimmick, and he ended up winning. So Jersey All-Pro offered him free training. So, of course, he took it. And um, later on that year, I started training, and uh, I blew out my knee. So uh, training kind of went south for me for a little bit. Then uh, he went on to continue. I uh, came back a couple years later, started with uh, Gino Caruso, and uh, I didn't really enjoy myself too much there. So uh, he offered to finish up my training in uh, Union City. Uh, A lot of people know it as uh, the Ace Arena, Ace Pro Wrestling. Um, We finished uh, there. The Ace Arena actually is uh, no more. I think they uh, closed down. Yeah, they uh they closed down the building, but uh the promotion's still alive and well. They uh their show's actually in December. They're actually having their uh well, it's not their first outside show, but it's like about their third or fourth outside show. Now uh, I I noticed some photos online of the uh, a match that you and Lethal had. I don't know when it was from, and uh, from the looks of it, it doesn't look like you fared very well against him in that. Uh, particular battle what's it like for you to work against someone like that someone that you grew up with i mean does it make it easier harder oh it's uh it's easier and harder um easier because uh we've done it so many times we trained together we uh when we were growing up we used to just always imitate whatever we saw on tv so it's kind of like a dance but uh in a way it's harder because he's always pushing me to get better and always just trying to get me to get on his level. So it's challenging, but uh, I enjoy every second of it, man. Were you always a big fan of uh, wrestling, even as a kid? Yeah, definitely. Growing up, I uh, was a big fan of uh, Shawn Michaels, uh, Rick Rude, and Ric Flair. I'd say you have a pretty good taste there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, now, you grew up in the Northeast. So I, I was going to say, I would imagine you were probably more of a WWF fan than you were a uh, fan of the NWA. Yeah, I uh, grew up watching uh, WWF. I, uh, not until I got older did I start watching some old NWA stuff. But uh, always been a big fan of the end. Uh, I'm sorry, always been a big fan of the WWE. Now, did you always know that you wanted to try out for wrestling, or, or did you have another career for yourself planned and just figured on, you know, trying it more on the side? I mean, I'm always interested in finding out the mindset of indie wrestlers because I know how hard it is to really break through and find some success. You know, some people have the willpower to make the sacrifices that they need to make, and as you know, a lot of people don't. Uh, I'm just kind of interested in, in what your, your path was. Honestly, I, uh, I've i never saw myself doing anything else. Any uh, Anything else that I've ever done was because it was either – My mother wanted me to do it, or I just saw my sister, like, going on to college, so it was just the next thing for me to do, but it's always been about wrestling for me. As a kid, the only thing I would dream about, talk about, 
wrestling. I didn't want anything else. Now, uh, you actually worked in Japan. You worked as Ernie Ladd Jr. for the Zero One promotion there, which was uh, co-founded by the late Shinya Hashimoto, as uh, well as Afro Man for the Hustle promotion. First, let's talk about Zero One. There have been some pretty prominent stars that have worked for the promotion, guys like CM Punk, Colt Cabana, uh, AJ Styles, Samoa Joe. How did the opportunity come about for you to work there, and who came up with the Ernie Ladd Jr. name for you? Because uh, I, I don't know that I really see the resemblance, so uh, take me through the process. <laughs> uh, it's actually a really, really funny story. Well, the way it started, um, an indie friend of mine, her name is uh, Sumi Sakai. I uh, I approached her because I've always wanted to work in Japan, and uh, she suggested I contact Nakamura, which... Uh, runs a promotion now. I uh, sent them a message on Facebook, and um, he asked me to send him some things, and he got back to me not too long after and offered me to do the clinic that they had. They had a, they were starting up a clinic, and they ended up choosing about six of us to go over there for about a month, train in their dojo, and uh, we got an opportunity to tour with them and work a couple shows. As far as the whole uh, Ernie Ladd gimmick, that was uh, kind of a funny story. I uh, I actually always butcher his name. Um, <laughs> M- Midori, uh, he's a big, huge wrestling fan in Japan. Everybody knows, I think Chris Sherkle actually wrote about him in his book, and uh, so did Mick Foley. If, uh, I'd actually probably have to go on my Facebook to actually get his name proper. Because uh, he came up with the idea, he uh, he actually came up with uh, came down with an Ernie Ladd poster, showed it to Nakamura and uh, Tanaka, and they both popped. And uh, Tanaka walked in the dressing room and he said, uh, he said Anirat, which uh, was Ernie Ladd's name in J- in Japan. And uh, <laughs> Tanaka telling me that that's my name, I uh, couldn't say no. Now. Uh... As far as hustle is concerned, you know, from what I gather, uh, there was traditionally less of an emphasis on scientific wrestling and more of an emphasis on over-the-top characters and showmanship, uh, not, not unlike the type of pro wrestling you would see in WWE or TNA or even Chikara. I don't know that it was like that toward the end, but it was early on. Tell me about your experience there and what your role was. Um, actually, um, as soon as uh, I got to Japan... When Nakamura picked me up, he asked me if I'd be interested in working Hustle. And because of the history of Hustle and just an opportunity to work for another promotion in Japan, I immediately said yes. Um, I wasn't too sure what they were going to have me do up until a couple days before when they let us know what we were going to do. As far as working for the company, uh, it was a lot easier working that show than it was any of the Zero One shows. It uh was more entertainment than uh, actual working, and uh, the crowd was completely different. They uh, they popped for just about everything and anything you did, and just the more over the top and the more uh, crazy you got, the more they popped. We got the opportunity to work in uh, Kurgan Hall, so there was no way I can turn that down. Of course, a lot of uh, a lot of history there. Definitely. Now, I've read horror stories from certain people about them living in Japan, training in the dojos, and conversely, I've heard people say that Japan was the best experience of their life. What was your experience like over there, and how long were you there for? I uh, I was actually, out of all the out of the other five guys, in total it was six of us, I was there the shortest. I uh, was there about two weeks in a day. I uh, had trouble with uh, getting the days off through work, and... Uh, there was some concern whether I was going to make the clinic or not, so Nakamura actually offered me to do the second clinic, but uh, I wasn't having it. So uh, we ended up finding, settling on a date, and uh, the day I got there, it was about a 13-and-a-half-hour flight. I immediately went to the dojo, so uh, it was no joke. Um, I'd say the hardest training I've done in my life, we were probably all miserable just from the pain, but... All we would do is just laugh. We would wake up. Um, I remember my buddy Kyle Matthews. He, uh, he works in Atlanta. He uh, he had icy hot patches when I got there all over his body, and that was a shock for me because I've never seen anyone do that. And about three days later, I was the same exact way. 
because it was just pure pain. But I don't take anything back, and uh, I look forward to doing it again. Now, you were only there for two weeks, but, I mean, did you have any sort of difficulty uh, as far as communication with the language uh, over there, or, or was it pretty much an easy trip for you? Um, not at all. Um, they actually understand English pretty well. Uh, the only part that was difficult was Nakamura wanted us to learn Japanese and speak to him in Japanese. If not, he would uh, basically make us do squats. And uh, after starting our training with 500 squats and us speaking to Nakamura in English and being forced to do more squats, it wasn't really fun. Now, uh, switching gears for a second, you, you told me something yesterday that kind of piqued my interest. Uh, you were actually in the first beginner's class with Florida Championship Wrestling, which, of course, is WWE's sole developmental territory these days. And you said you learned a lot about what it is they look for in a performer down there. Give me, give me some examples of, of exactly what it is they look for in a, uh, a talent. First off, they, uh, they want the whole thing. They want the whole package deal. It's not, uh, it's not just, oh, you're some guy who's a great worker who can go in and do all these cool things. They want someone that's marketable in and out the ring. They, uh, they want someone that they can present to the public and represent the company in a good way. They, uh, they frown upon a lot of indie guys who believe all these cool flips and uh, all these cool things that they can do makes the crowd go, go home happy. But uh, what they want is just someone who is coachable and can understand what they want from you. They, you hear the terminology a lot over there, less is more. And I'm a firm believer of that. Me being a big guy, I also can do all these things, but I choose not to. One, I'll stay in the business longer. Two, it's not what they're looking for. They want to make everything seem real, and a lot of guys just aren't understanding that. Now, uh, you actually had a chance to work matches with several uh, names that have been brought up to WWE TV in recent years, guys like Sheamus, uh, Tyler Rex. You said you got to work with David Otunga plenty of times. My sympathies to you. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I believe you said also Santino even came down one day, and you got to work some spots with him. I mean, that must have been a big thrill for you. Yeah, it was actually um, maybe about uh, three weeks before WrestleMania. I believe uh, that was a WrestleMania that he did uh, that he did the Santina gimmicks. He came down and uh, was really, really humble, really, really nice guy, and got in the ring with all of us. I got a chance to run a couple spots with him, and uh, really, really nice guy. I actually learned that he's a uh, Canadian. I never knew that. I found out that day, and uh, he actually talked to us and. Um, just acted like he was one of the guys. He uh, he didn't treat us badly or anything. Some people, because of their position or because they're this larger-than-life person on TV, maybe maybe wouldn't be that way. But uh, he was just one of the guys, and we asked for advice. We talked to him, and he was happy to give it to us. That was actually my next question. Uh, you know, did any of those guys impart any uh, wisdom on you in the time that you uh, worked with them? Seamus was really nice. Um, Oh, whenever I was down there, I was always so nervous. He, uh, him and uh, Norman actually always told me to loosen up, which helped me out a lot. Eric Escobar also had me, told me to get a little more aggressive, which it was a little confusing. Guys telling me to loosen up and other guys telling me to be more aggressive, but uh, I somewhere found the middle ground where uh, I actually got what they wanted. Just, just the opportunity to talk to them and see that they going through the same things that we went through. I'm sorry, they went through the same things that I'm going through now or any of the other indie guys going through now, trying to get a break. And you mentioned uh, Norman a moment ago. I think you're referring to uh, Norman Smiley, who I believe is a trainer down there in FCW, correct? Yes, definitely am. Now, uh, just last month, you uh, worked in Canada for the very first time. You were actually one half of the main event on a Macho Man Randy Savage memorial show uh, against Devin Nicholson, who is uh, – Hannibal on that show, who he also happened to be promoting the show. Uh, this was the show. Now, was this the same show that Greg Valentine uh, no showed? <laughs> yeah, that uh, that was the one. There's a couple couple different stories circling around. Uh, I've heard several. Um, Devin told me one, kind of a bad deal on both ends. I don't. I guess the only two people that really know the entire truth would be uh, Devin and. Uh, mm -hmm. Greg the Hammer, but um, 
it was unfortunate that he couldn't make the show. It was a um, great show, great crowd, easy show, and we had a fun time doing it. Um, it was for Macho Man, and uh, every guy on there poured their heart out and tried to send the crowd home happy. Now, you said the experience meant a lot to you also because uh, Lanny Poffo himself said that he was really impressed with your work and spoke to you for a little while. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, um, after my match, um, Jay and Lenny Poffo were actually on the other side of the curtain, and uh, Jay gave me a hug, and he told me I did a great job. And uh, Lenny Poffo pulled me aside, and he was just really impressed. He actually uh, was one of the commentators on the match, and I really didn't even know until I actually saw the match on uh, YouTube. But after that, uh, we had about a half-hour conversation in the locker room, and he was just telling me, all the things that he went through while he was on the road. And he just gave me advice, and he told me not to give up. He uh, said I'm a big guy and move really, really well, and uh, he hoped nothing but the best for me. Now, now, generally speaking, have you worked more as a baby face or a heel? And uh, and which do you prefer, if given the choice? Um, I've actually worked more as a heel. It uh, It's a lot easier for me. I haven't been given the opportunity to work much as a baby face, I'd love the opportunity because uh, I'm sure one day I'm going to need to. God God willing, I get that break. But uh, I say right now, I'd like working as a heel. It's and um, just, I, yeah. well, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, you know, you listen, that's okay. you listen to other interviews with other wrestlers, and I think eight or nine times out of ten, they say the exact same thing that you said. It's just a lot, it's not only easier, but they say it's a lot more fun. You can be a lot more... Uh, you know, creative, I guess, when you're a heel as opposed to a baby face. Yeah, I believe so. You can, um, I, a lot of guys think that, uh, that I'm a good heel. Some people say that I should try being a baby face. I feel more comfortable being a heel because I think I could be a little bit more myself. Not that I'm a bad guy or anything, but, uh, <laughs> it's just, it's just, I don't know. I get a, I get a joy out of pissing people off. I, uh, I remember one time I got an old lady pissed off so badly she actually took a swing at me and almost caught my nose. Uh, but um, just touching back to the whole um, Ernie Ladd gimmick, um, Masanori Hori, I don't know if um, I don't know if you know him. He's the one that came up with the whole Ernie Ladd thing. So, uh, so I, I guess he's the one we can uh, we can blame for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was fun though. It was fun. I actually got a press time with uh, some Japanese press because of it. Oh, that's great. I mean, hell, I mean, in a way, you know, to be uh, to be kind of uh, associated with the WWE Hall of Famer, it's not a bad deal. Not at all. So tell me, what what, what lies ahead for Nathan Banner? I mean, do you, do you still see yourself in the WWE ring one day? I mean, based on your experience in FCW, you, you would seem to already have a leg up on the competition, so to speak. I mean, you're a young guy. I think you're only 26 years old. What does the future hold for you? Um, I'm hoping that WWE is in store for me. Um, that's uh, I keep knocking on the door. I'm just hoping they're going to open it soon. I'm not getting any younger, so uh, I've been trying for a while. I have last time I was in FCW, I was uh, 23. So um, hopefully, uh, I can either get a call and uh, do another tryout or. I might have to go to Florida again and see if I uh, end up paying for a tryout because uh, it's the only thing I want. And uh, you can't really survive too much on the independence, unfortunately. Now, tell everybody how they can find you. I mean, uh, what, what indie promotions are you working for these days? Do you have any dates coming up, Twitter, Facebook, uh, anything like that? Yeah, I um, the next show, I, I'm actually going to be in uh, Costa Rica on the 29th, I believe for a promotion called uh, First Wrestling uh, Res- First Wrestling Society. Um, they're a small company out of Costa Rica. They're actually one of two promotions in Costa Rica. And uh, I have uh, actually, I'm waiting for a date from uh, Jersey Wrestling Elite. It's uh, one of the sister promotions of Ace. And uh, just anyone who uh, who contacts me, Facebook or uh or Twitter. I actually just started using my Twitter. Uh, I believe I'm uh, under the Prodigy Nathan banner. I actually just uh, requested you on Twitter so uh, they can follow me through you. But uh, I'm still learning how to use it. I'm not too uh, 
techni- technology savvy with Twitter. Everything else I can manage. Well, if there's one thing you could learn about Twitter, just uh, see the way that some uh, professional wrestlers have been using it of late, and uh, it'll scare you away from Twitter in a heartbeat. Yeah, I don't, I don't doubt that. <laughs> well, Nathan, it was, it was my pleasure having you on, and uh, best of luck to you in the future, and hopefully we'll see you in a WWE or even an ROH ring one of these days. Oh, thank you so much, and uh, thank you very much for everything, and uh, I look forward to speaking to you again soon. We're going to be back in just a second with yet another very special guest. Oh, we're just getting started here. Up next, my interview with the reigning Ring of Honor World Television Champion, Shay Lethal. You're listening to the Solomonster Sounds Off on SEScoops.com. Hey, guys, this is Jay Lethal, and you're listening to the Sound Off with the Solomonster. Ooh, yeah. We're back, and uh, right now we have a very special guest joining us. Uh, on a recent episode of Ring of Honor TV, Kevin Kelly referred to him as the hottest young free agent in wrestling. He spent more than five years with TNA Wrestling, capturing a record number of X-Division titles and working with legends like Kurt Angle and Ric Flair. He's since returned to his old stomping grounds of ROH, recently defeating El Generico to become the Ring of Honor World Television Champion, making him the first active champion to appear on this podcast Jay Lethal joins us on the line right now. Jay, welcome to the Sound Off. Thanks for having me. How is it going? Not too bad, not too bad. I, uh, well, I just good, interviewed good. a good friend of yours, the uh, the prodigy, <laughs> Nathan Banner, who you also ah, trained. And, uh, I did, I did. And, He's yeah, making uh, quite a name for himself now. Yes, he is. And uh, he was he was talking some smack about you, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, it, it's it's uh, well, if, if he was, it's uh, he's he's harmless well, to me anyway. Uh, we, we've actually gone to high school. I've known him my whole life, so I mean, uh, to me anyway, his bark is worse than his bite. <laughs> well, he he's a good guy, and, and you know, it's really an he interesting dichotomy in, in that you know we have two friends, one of whom is is trying to make a name for himself. He's working his way up the ladder, and in your case, you've already attained quite a bit of success in wrestling. Uh, you know, case in point, let's talk about your return to Ring of Honor. Uh, you spent some time there in the early days of the promotion. Now you're back. ROH is back on television. Uh, it was, I believe, the second episode, and you were featured in the main event challenging El Generico for his TV title in uh, one hell of a fun match, by the way. And, uh, oh, and thank you. Won. you. Thank you. First, I mean, what did you think of the match first? And second, how does it make you feel to come back after all these years and instantly become an impact player there? Well, I mean, uh, my match against El Generico, where I beat him for the television title, I mean, that that match was, I felt awesome. Uh, I loved every second of it. Uh, till, up until that time, it was one of the longest matches that I've ever had because, uh, of course, working for TNA, uh, guys who were on the same level as I was weren't given too much time to have a match. So, I mean, the most I've ever had to wrestle was probably six, seven, eight minutes uh, the match with El Generico actually went about almost 20 minutes. So uh, I felt it was it was awesome. I love working El Generico. I've worked him plenty of times before, and every time we step into the ring together, it's always <coughs> excuse me, it's always uh, a great match. He's a really fun guy to work with, and he's got a cool gimmick. Uh, you know, he's El Generico. He's the, the Spanish luchador. Oddly enough, he barely speaks Spanish, which is pretty funny. But, yeah, it was uh, cool to be back in Ring of Honor, especially since I hadn't been there in over six years. The last time I was there, there was different guys there, like uh, Samoa Joe was on top, and Austin Aries was just making a name for himself there. So it was kind of cool to come back and see the different faces, although the product itself is still the same. They still pride themselves on being all about wrestling, which I think they do like no other company has. And, and like you said, I mean, the company, it's, it's gone through quite a few changes since you uh, departed there in 2006. Obviously, Gabe Sapolsky is no longer uh, there. A lot of the original stars have been replaced by newer faces. I mean, I know you haven't been back for too long, but how, how different has the experience been for you being back there so far? Well, it hasn't been different at all. I mean, I would say the only thing that has changed 
uh, are the new faces that have been added and uh, some of the older faces that have been taken away. Like I said, they, I, I am one of the strongest, uh, I'm sorry, I actually believe strongly that uh, Ring of Honor has always had an excellent wrestling product. It's just their only problem was they they were having trouble getting this product to the masses. And uh, one of the changes uh, to Ring of Honor is the Sinclair Broadcasting Group has now bought them out, which, I mean, being a part of the company, you don't really notice the change uh, because it's, it's more of a behind-the-scenes kind of change. <clears throat> and like I said, Ring of Honor's always had the best wrestling product they just had to get it out to the masses, and now they actually have that chance to uh, being backed by Sinclair Broadcasting Group. And I'll give you a cool analogy, though. It's almost as if uh, you have a Mustang. Let's say you have a, a brand-new Mustang. You use your car every single day for, let's say, five years straight. Then all of a sudden you got to take a little trip, and you got to move away, but you got to leave your Mustang at home. Uh, you're gone away from the house for six years. While you're away, uh, let's say somebody in your family, let's say your dad puts a brand new engine in the Mustang. So when you come back, it's still the same Mustang. It just has a brand new engine. And that brand new engine in Ring of Honor would be the Sinclair Broadcasting Group, but it's still the Mustang. It's still Ring of Honor. It's still got that great same product. And uh, actually, news just broke in the last couple of days that uh, you and Generica are going to face off one more time at the uh, next set of TV tapings coming up, I believe, on November 5th in Louisville. What do you think about that? Yeah, I actually can't wait for that, actually. Like I said, every time I step into the ring with El Generico, I love every single match I've ever had with him, and I'm sure this one will be no different. Now, uh, you got your start in the business at a pretty young age. I, I believe you were only 16 in uh Actually, Nathan had mentioned that you had won a contest held by uh, Jersey All Pro Wrestling, which earned you uh, six months of free training at their school, which I believe has since shut down. You know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about about Jersey All Pro, uh, which I was only mildly familiar with, and you look at the match results during your time there, and there were a couple of instances where your parents were actually uh, involved in, in certain angles and certain matches. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, before I get to that, to touch on something you said, Jersey All Pro Wrestling, uh, they did have a contest very similar to the WWE Tough Enough at the time, uh, their contest there, where the winner would be trained for free. So I, I was actually the winner of the Jersey All Pro Wrestling contest, and it wasn't a contest where the winner gets trained for six months. It was supposed to be the winner gets trained for a lifetime or however long it takes for them to become a professional wrestler. But uh, within six months of training, uh, the other students stopped going, and uh, the school closed down, so I had nowhere to go. Uh, luckily, two of my buddies were being trained at the time by Mikey Whipwreck, so I was able to jump into the class with them. So that's where I finished up my training. So, uh, I mean, it just made it, when you said it, it made it sound like uh, I want to six-month course to be a professional wrestler. I actually won a lifetime course to be a wrestler, but their their school closed down is what happened. And uh, to also, tell, you mentioned, uh, yeah, sometimes my parents would be involved in angles only because they were at every single show, uh, especially when I came out. They were the loudest in the crowd. They were at every single show so much that uh, the fans started to uh, recognize who they were. They started to be... Uh, very familiar to most of the fans. Uh, like after the shows, not only were the fans asking for my autograph, but they would say hello to my parents. Uh, they were, and my parents were very, very friendly. So, of course, uh, certain guys would try and use that to get what we call heat, I guess, in the business. Uh, sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. Uh, if I had my way, I wouldn't have involved them at all, even though they did have some fun doing it. I, I just didn't really, I never really liked it. But, yeah, some guys did try and use my parents in some of the angles and such. They they loved it. They got a huge kick out of it every single time. The only the, the funny I... part about that was uh, in a company called JCW, we tried it. And uh, my mother was actually involved in a segment where I got beat down in the ring. And uh, one of the guys came out and kind of, like, threatened her, and she was on the ground. But... I mean, my parents got such a kick out of it that in the standing in the back of the arena where my parents normally sat was my dad 
with the hugest grin on his face because he just thought the whole thing was funny. So that kind of ruined the whenever we tried to do it at Jersey uh, JCW, only because <laughs> my dad just thought it was so funny, you know. And I can't blame him because it was it was funny, but he was standing in the back laughing the whole time. You know, I think they caught him laughing once or twice on camera too. <laughs> That's great. Now, now it was actually yeah. uh, after your Jersey All Pro days, you uh, had gotten noticed by TNA Wrestling. That's when you made your way over there. You actually spent uh, well over five years there, and you made quite a name for yourself. And toward the end, you had your feud with Ric Flair, which I'll, I'll ask you about uh, in, in a moment. But you kind of fell back down the ladder a little bit after that. You were hardly getting any TV time at all coming off uh, what had probably been the highest profile feud of your career. And, uh, and then on April 21st, comes the news that you had been released by TNA, which caught a lot of people off guard. Did the move come as a surprise to you, or, or was it a situation where you already saw the writing on the wall and, and knew it was coming? Uh, I, I kind of did see it coming a little bit. Uh, I'd say 40 45%. I was uh, kind of assured that I uh, so there may be a problem coming. I mean, any time a wrestler is sitting at home for five to six months not doing anything, totally healthy. Uh, there's always some suspicion raised in his head, you know. So, I mean, I I, I guess I could say I kind of saw it, but I didn't really think it would happen. And we'd never, as professional wrestlers, ever really think it's going to happen, or we don't want to think that it's going to happen. But deep down inside, in the back of our head, that has to be floating around there. Let me ask you this: As someone who spent quite a while working for TNA, what do you, what do you feel, if anything, that they're missing of you, in your view? I mean, they've been around now for for nearly a decade. You know, we've seen them bring in a, a couple of big names, and it never seems like there's any real upward momentum there. I mean, I, I'd have to think it would be uh, really frustrating for some of the people who work there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, uh, I think the main thing they're missing is a uh, the main thing would be a lack of direction. I mean, the, the the whole time I worked there, I don't remember who was the head person in charge. Like, if I had a problem, I never knew who to go to. There there was never that one person. This is the, the tell-all person. This person is in charge. This person makes all the decisions. There was just too many people making decisions. Uh, that, that was their main, main problem. Also, uh, and... I mean, I, I guess I'm a little bit biased because I was in the X Division, and I guess that's pretty much made the main thing that I was doing in the company was being a part of the X Division. But uh, the X Division never really, we never really had too many storylines. I was a lucky one because I got uh, a pretty funny character that lasted a lot longer than anybody thought it would last. But as far as the X Division goes in general, not... Uh, not uh, singling myself out, but the X Division was never, nobody in the X Division was ever given like a solid storyline to run off of. And uh, I, I made this comparison a couple times. Uh, watching in TNA, watching match one, I'd say one to four, which mainly most of the time was the X Division, uh, was like watching an episode of Seinfeld. Uh, when Seinfeld starts, there's a problem that arises somewhere in the middle of the show. By the end of the show, the problem is solved, and the next episode of Seinfeld has nothing to do with the one that you just watched. Uh, there was no continuation of any storylines within the X Division. Uh, that would be problem two, and I could go on and on. But those are the two main problems that I would say. Uh, that the company is facing now. Although, I mean, I I guess I could be wrong. I think uh, they did one of the highest numbers that they've ever done before on uh, their last TV. Now, now since you brought the X Division, well, what do I know? You, you, held, you held the X Division Championship, uh, I think, a record setting six times. I think uh, you and AJ Styles are tied for that. And uh, a couple of months after your release, DNA had its Destination X pay per view, which a lot of people, I think, were hoping would lead to. Uh, some something of a resurrection for for that division. They brought in some people from the heyday of the division, some independent talents. Did TNA ever reach out to you about participating in that show? Uh, they did. They did reach out to me, but due to uh, uh, prior engagements, as you would say, uh, I, I could not be a part of the actual pay per view. And, and in a way, in a way, I'm glad 
that I wasn't because I saw a lot of things leading up to the pay-per-view and on the pay-per-view that I, I just rode me the wrong way. I really didn't like it. Uh, one of the things, for instance, was uh, the, the, just how they the whole build-up to Destination X. Normally, when uh, TNA has a pay-per-view coming up, let's say it's Let's just say, for instance, this Sunday, uh, TNA has a pay-per-view called Hardcore Justice. Let's just say that that's this Sunday. On Thursday, there should be a lot of things happening on Thursday that directly affect matches that are going to happen on Sunday. It's pay-per-view. That's what happens in wrestling. That's normally how you do things. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say a perfect thing to do would be the last thing you see at that Thursday's TV leading into the pay-per-view would possibly be something involving whatever is the biggest feud for your Sunday's pay-per-view, let's say your main event. Something should happen to increase the storyline, to enhance the storyline, to make people really want to buy that pay-per-view on Sunday. Well, that's not what TNA did. Uh, the Thursday before Destination X, you would think that since it's Destination X, it's a big X Division pay-per-view. Uh, you would think that the last thing you would see on Thursday would have something to do with the X Division title, or at least one of the matches on that Destination X pay-per-view. Uh, this wasn't the case. The last thing you see and hear on that Thursday's television leading into that Sunday's pay-per-view, this Destination X big X Division pay-per-view, was about the uh, Bound for Glory series tournament that they were having I, and I couldn't believe what I was watching and hearing there, there was no hype there was no build to anything I mean I felt embarrassed and sorry for my friends who had to be a part of that pay-per-view I mean because I mean it was an all destiny it was an all exhibition pay-per-view and I mean in wrestling there's always clicks there's always group of people who hang out with certain groups and of course I hung out with every single one of the X Division mostly the machine guns, guys like Sanjay Dutt when he was there, and uh, we, like we all went out to eat afterwards. So, of course, these are my personal friends, and I have to watch them be a part of something that's supposed to be the, the, the heart and soul of TNA, the x and This is what really brought them into the light of in the people's eyes, and just to see the way they went about the whole pay-per-view, just, I just didn't like it at all. I mean, it almost makes you wonder why even do the pay-per-view in the first place if uh, if you weren't going to put the focus on it. Right, right, right. I just didn't get it. Now, I want to talk uh, just briefly about the uh, Black Machismo character. As a, uh, a Randy Savage fan, it was a personal favorite of mine. Um, it was, I, As I remember, it was Kevin Nash on TV who kind of inspired you to uh, start the gimmick. I, I guess others had seen you do your Savage impersonation behind the scenes and, and thought it was funny. I, I take it you were a big Macho Man fan growing up? Oh, huge. He was my idol. I think it was TNA once on television. I could be wrong about this. They claimed that you had actually spoken with Savage on the phone. Is that is that uh, accurate? That is correct. That is correct. Uh, shortly after uh, uh, the gimmick had taken its course, I was actually able to, uh, on the indie scene, have a match with Lanny Poffo, the Macho Man's brother. It was sort of like uh, I was pretending to be the Macho Man, and he was Lanny Poffo, the Macho Man's brother, and we had a Brothers from Another Mother singles match, which was pretty cool. Uh, about a week or two before I had that match, I actually spoke on the phone with uh, someone who sounded like the Macho Man, who I thought was the Macho Man, and uh, they pretty much gave me their blessing for the doing the gimmick, and they thought it was pretty cool. But you never can be too sure because I'm sure I'm not the only one who can do the Macho Man voice. So uh, after I worked, after I wrestled Lanny Poffo, he told me he would go home and find out for me. Took my number down, and the very next day he gave me a call and he told me that he talked to Randy and he said that uh, it was really him. The weird thing about the uh, Macho Man character, though. Uh, Kevin Nash was the main person who thought I should do it on television. Uh, he was a good friend of the Macho Man. Uh, I was an idol of the Macho Man, and I didn't want to do this gimmick if it somehow made fun of the Macho Man or anything like that. Uh, but I do feel that uh, it was booked in a way 
only because I I, uh, I would do the Macho Man voice in the locker room sometimes. So, of course, the office got wind of it. They heard it, and it's just a big joke to them. They heard it. They thought it was funny. It was funny to a lot of people. So the, the, the role was never booked to be anything serious. It was never booked to go as long as it did. It was never – not much faith was put into the character at all. But uh, luckily, I was able to turn that around, and it lasted pretty long. And uh, I don't think it came out too much like a uh, like a big joke. Hopefully, hopefully no. not. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. As, by the way, I, I watched that Ringside Collectibles video that you did uh, up on YouTube <laughs> with the new uh, Macho King action figure, which I, I believe you also put on your website. And I cannot even really do this video justice. People just need to go see it for themselves. It's uh, quite a sight to behold. Oh, cool, cool. It's actually up on my website right now, which is uh, www.thelethalj.com. Now, uh, eventually, actually, before I get to what, this, I just want to ask you this question. Uh, Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff, they came to TNA. Around that same time, you started doing that open invitational on Impact where you would challenge different legends to a match. You brought Jim the Anvil Nightheart in one week. He beat you and then disappeared from TV. I think Tatanka came in, beat you never was seen again. I guess my my question would be, what was the point of that whole thing? It seemed as though it might be leading to somebody like Randy Savage maybe appearing at the end. I don't know if that was the end game that was planned at any point, but it just seemed like you lost a couple of matches and then you disappeared off TV for a couple of months. (laughs) That whole legend uh, tournament thing that I was hosting, uh, where, I like as you said, I I brought the legends in, like uh, Tatanka and Jim Nianzo Nightheart. And uh, like I said before, this, I believe, was a, uh, originally a gimmick booked uh, because it was something funny. And I guess it was uh, funny to kind of see me pretend to be the Macho Man, and it was cool to get to see some of the older guys like Jimmy Anvil Nightheart and uh, Tatanka not only come but to beat the crap out of me. Uh, but I don't think there was ever – because this was not – too many people know this, but uh, that was originally an idea pitched to the office by Consequences Creed, my tag partner, except when he pitched it to the office, uh, he pitched it as uh, bringing in old tag teams because Creed and I were a tag team and they weren't really doing anything with us on television. So he thought it'd be cool if we brought in like uh, the Rock and Roll Express or the Midnight Express, old tag teams like that. Uh, I guess when the office heard it they loved the idea somehow it got changed to just singles guys coming in which kind of left my buddy creed with nothing to do which was ultimately one of the reasons for his release but no uh this gimmick uh this uh legends tournament was never i don't think there was any uh big payoff that was thought of i just thought it was they thought it was something cool to do for now and when hogan and bischoff came in uh, much like every single storyline in TNA, it, it's almost like they came in and if you turn, if you write down every single storyline that was going on in TNA on a piece of paper and lay it on the table, uh, Eric Bischoff and Hogan came in and just flipped the table upside down and brought in the new table and we pretty much started from scratch. So everybody was in the middle of a storyline, mainly Abyss, which off the top of my head, he was, I mean, in a blood feud that just, once Hogan and Bischoff came in, just this ended out of nowhere. There was no blow off to anything. It was, and I mean, I'm not saying that I'm upset about this or that it was wrong or the right thing to do. It just, it was weird to me that nothing was finished. Everything was left. Well, we're just going to leave it and start all over. So uh, that, that legend's, uh, tournament that I was having just just ended. And, I mean, I guess it was good because, like I said, I don't think they had a big blow off or it wasn't leading to anything big. It was just, uh, what legend can we get this week to come in? Now, uh, eventually you were back on TV and you actually got to work with the uh, Nature Boy, Ric Flair. You actually got to wrestle him twice. And uh, the first time it was on pay-per-view and you beat him with his own uh, figure four leg lock. What was that whole experience like for you? Not not just winning the match, but uh, working with Rick in general. Oh, working with Rick was really cool. I mean, I like to say that it was the greatest night of my life. Only because, I mean, I come from a family of six children. 
Uh, me and my brothers would wrestle around in the living room all the time. One of the uh, images or memories that I have in my head is my mom went uh, to North Carolina to visit her family, leaving my dad with all the kids in the house. And I remember uh, we ordered pizza, and there was like a, the Royal Rumble came on television. Ric Flair was in it. And, oh, I just remember having the greatest time in my living room with my brothers watching wrestling. And it was so cool that uh, the, my older brothers were such big Ric Flair fans, just like I was. And I, I can't remember how many times we put each other in the figure fours. And now we can fast forward, and now they're, they're little brothers in the ring with Ric Flair, somebody that we watched all the time growing up. I, I mean, it was just one of the greatest moments of my life. I loved every second of it. And tell me about those two uh, famous promos you did with Rick. Uh, Eric Bischoff and uh, Flair, too, I think, actually both had high praise for you afterwards. Flair, Flair even said, he does me better than I do me. And uh, I remember the, uh, the second promo, actually, was probably the most entertaining verbal battle I've ever seen. And the great thing about it was it seemed like he actually had a hard time keeping up with you, not the other way around. Uh, how, much of that did, how, how, much of you, how much of that did the two of you discuss beforehand, and how much of that was just completely off the cuff? All the promos were, uh, there was never anything discussed beforehand, only because, I mean, he's Ric Flair. You can't tell him what to do. And, you know, the, the funny part is whenever you see anybody with a microphone, any wrestler walk to the ring, any wrestler in general with a microphone in his hand, nine times out of ten, they already have bullet points in their head. They already know what they want to talk about, know what they're going to say, nine times out of ten. And uh, this was not one of those times Ric Flair... Uh, you, you can't write anything for him to say. Therefore, you couldn't tell me what to say because we didn't know what Ric Flair was going to say, so I just had to feed off of him. Uh, let, let's put that on, stack that on top of the fact that this was only the second time in the company that I was ever given a chance to come anywhere near a microphone. The first time uh, was with Consequences Creed, and we were uh, trying to accuse uh, suicide of being Frankie Kazarian which was a 30-second promo in the ring where I just spat a bunch of funny nonsense out. But uh, that was the only time that I had even gotten near a microphone. Now, this time I would be holding the microphone all alone against uh, one of the greatest promo guys in this business today. I mean, it was nerve-wracking, to say the least. Would you ever consider going back to, uh, to TNA at some point, or is that uh, Dork uh, for you? Maybe in the future, but not right now, not in this point in time. I'm I'm very much looking forward to what the future holds. Now, before you signed your contract with ROH, were there ever any talks between you and WWE? Is that something you would have been interested in? I mean, uh, that's always in the back of my head. As a matter of fact, I can honestly say for most of the guys in my generation, uh, that's what we became wrestling fans for. We loved the WWE, uh, WWF at the time. It's what help shape the love that we have for professional wrestling. And I think any of them would be lying to say that it, it wouldn't be cool to at least get to work for the company that started your love for this business. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, at some point in time, I'd love to work for them. Let's bring it back around to Ring of Honor here before we end. Uh, you guys are only a few episodes in on your TV deal with Sinclair so far. I, I, I've really enjoyed what I've seen so far. I know there are people listening right now who don't know too much about the product, how important is 2012 going to be for ROH as far as really establishing itself to the masses? Oh, wow. I mean, I have seen uh, just a sneak peek at our calendar for uh, 2012, and we definitely are doing exactly what we need to do. We are going any and everywhere. We're going all over. We're really spreading the word. Like I said before, Ring of Honor – has what I believe to be the greatest wrestling product, the greatest wrestling product out there. They, their only problem was it, they couldn't get it to the masses, and now they have that opportunity. And in 2012, we're going to make a huge, uh, we're, we're going to make a real impact in professional wrestling. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. No uh, problem. Right now, no any, problem. Right now, if there's any bookings coming up that you'd like to let people know about, I know you have a website, a Twitter account, a Facebook, and all that. So tell people how they can reach you. I guess the only thing I'd, last thing I'd like to say would be uh, 
as you know, we do live in this world of social networking and all this media, different outlets to keep in contact with people. And I have a few of those. I, I have a Twitter, and my Twitter name is at the lethal J, and that's the J is spelled out J A Y. So that would be at T H E L E T H A L J A Y. That's my Twitter, and I have a website as well, which would be www.thelethalj.com. And uh, I also, uh, for fan mail, I have a Yahoo account, which would be thelethalj at yahoo.com. I'm, I'm kind of focusing on this The Lethal J. I love that name. <laughs> so I guess uh, nobody snatched it up before you had a chance to, uh, oh, to grab it. I, I love Nope, not at all. I love it so much I had to trademark it. <laughs> the uh, Ring of Honor World Television Champion, Jay Lethal. Jay, thanks for taking the time, and uh, best of luck to you. No problem. Thank you. Take care. Thanks to everybody for listening. As always, be well, stay safe, and uh, we will see you right back here next week for another episode of The Solomonster Sounds Off on SEScoops.com. Let me tell you something, fella. This is Joel from Northern Ireland. I am AJ Grimaldo. And quite simply, the fastest 60 minutes on the Internet. The Solar Monster sounds off on SEScoops.com.